When I think of this trip, I see David and me in the front seat of his car. He wants something better than he has. I want precisely what he has already. Hey everybody, welcome to What the Flick, Alonzo Bibbs. Our special guest, Amy Nicholson from LA Weekly, is gonna tell us about End of the Tour, starring Jesse Eisenberg and Jason Segel. Yeah, so End of the Tour was one of the surprises of Sundance because you have Jason Segel from Forgetting Sarah Marshall playing a novelist, David Foster Wallace, who famously wrote that over a thousand page novel, Infinite Jest. And in here, he's paired with Jesse Eisenberg and the two go on a road trip and talk about books. Trailer. David. Wallace. Welcome to Minneapolis. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm David Lewis. Oh, How are you? hi. Okay, David and David. We only just met. He's writing a piece on the tour. What's this story about in your mind? Just what it's like to be the most talked about writer in the country, that sort of thing. You're like a nervous guy, huh? <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'm okay. How are you? Because I'm terrified. I gotta ask, what is with the bandana? I know that it's a security blanket for me whenever I'm kind of afraid my head is going to explode. <laughs> Hey, isn't it reassuring to have a lot of people read you? I think if the book is about anything, yeah. it's about the question of why. Why am I doing it? And what's so American about what I'm doing? If um, they're responding to your work and your work is really personal, then reading you is another way of meeting you, isn't that right? That's so good. Thank you. I don't know why you mean to me. I think that if there's a sort of sadness for people under 45, it has something to do with pleasure and achievement and entertainment. Like a sort of emptiness at the heart of what they thought was going on. I don't know. I got a real serious fear of being a certain way. I treasure my regular guyness. You don't crack open a thousand page book because you heard the author was a regular guy. You do it because he's brilliant. What is with you? What is with you? I'm not so sure you want to be me. Just be a good guy. The more people think you're really great, the bigger the fear of being a fraud is. David thought books existed to stop you from feeling lonely. Living those days with him reminded me of what life is like. And the conversation is the best one I ever had. Okay, I, confession, uh, I purchased and began and never finished Infinite Jest. You and most people. Okay, I like to think that I'm in a safe space on at that one. At least you purchased it, I just look at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's sitting on my shelf taunting me, you know. I saw the cover, it was fantastic, so I assumed the book was great. <laughs> it's, you know, I just, I, it was hard. I couldn't, I, I, you know, and I'm gonna tackle it again when I'm ready for footnotes in my novel, but I, it was more than I could handle. Um, I, it's funny because the, the, uh, there, were, there were two movies at Sundance this year that were based on true stories, mm -hmm. that are built around interviews, and that feature former Freaks and Geeks cast members. So, you know, that was, that was a, the, this and True Story have a weird, um, it's a whole new a weird genre. overlap. Yeah. yeah. But True Story was terrible, and this one's really good. This is one of my favorite movies of the year. I wow. think this is, no, I really do. I, I saw it at Sundance, I saw it again, and what I really admire about this movie is the way that it works from every angle that I watch it from. I watch it from David Lipsky's angle, the angle of a guy who is interviewing a celebrity writer, a writer who has the success that Lipsky has not yet achieved, um, and looking up to him, but also experiencing extreme jealousy and trying to put that on hold because he's on record. And then I see David Foster Wallace seeing a writer who clearly he's able to have a, a friendly connection with and not being able to really connect with him because again, there's the ever-present tape recorder. Right. And so it's this always this tape recorder getting in the way of two people having a real connection and yet they say such incredible things that I was really involved. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. Most of the dialogue in here is taken directly from those tapes that Lipsky made because the piece he was working on for Rolling Stone never ran. And so yeah. we put them in a shoebox, mm. and then we see him at the beginning of the film taking the film, taking these tapes out of the shoebox after David Foster Wallace commits suicide 12 years after they went on this road trip. And so they've just memorized this dialogue and they bring it to life. And what's interesting is how Jason Segel is able to play this character who has so much going on under the surface that at the time David Lipsky didn't even know. At the time, Dave. David Foster Wallace was heavily medicated on antidepressants. He had maybe already been through electroshock therapy. Wow. He was in a bad place. And Jason Segel has to channel all of that when nobody else in the room even knows what's happening. What I like about this movie is, um, you know, we, I just saw uh, Irrational Man. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that bugs me about the, some of the recent Woody Allen movies is that he used to be a lot better at doing conversations between smart people. Yeah. You know, even if he was mocking them, even if he was making fun of their sort of intellectual pretensions or whatever, he knew how to write dialogue between sort of college graduates who were very, you know, getting into heady stuff 
And that still sounded like human speech, which it doesn't now. Like in, in a rational man, it sounds like a computer generated or something weird. Like it just it doesn't ever <laughs> flow. I am quippy. You are quippy. Kind of. Here's yeah. Here's a reference to something intellectual. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Beady bada ba. You know, it's it it doesn't have that kind of human flow. And this movie, it's sort of like, oh wow, yeah, this is what smart people talk like. You yeah. know, and and it's it it never feels sort of unbearably, you know, academic. It just feels like these guys are writers. They're talking about their craft and what goes into it and other writers and that kind of thing. And then, then at the same time, you know, they also talk about Die Hard. And well, Alanis Morissette. Yeah, Alanis Morissette. They, yeah, go, Alanis see, Morissette. they go see Broken Arrow go see Broken at the Arrow Mall of it. America. And they <laughs> love it because it's awesome. That's why. Although I forgot how stupid the ending was with that shot of John Travolta's face. The missile, like, yeah. <laughs> shot out the back of the train. Um, Not John Woo's greatest movie, but no, nonetheless, but entertaining. fun nonetheless. But that's one of the things I admire about this film. You see a lot of films about great writers. And it's all, you know, and, and some of the movies are amazing, like Il Postino, and it's all about how your writing, you know, affects everyone, and like, these words of the people who need them, and yeah, okay, fine, that's wonderful. Here is someone who is being as candid as they can under the circumstances, and we're finding out just how normal and, and, and weird just people are. He is obsessed with Alanis Morissette. He is addicted to television to the extent that he doesn't have one. Right. You know, because and, he wouldn't do anything else. And, you know? and it's, thankfully, it's not a movie about writers that you have to ever watch anybody be like... Tick, 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 tick. I know. Because that's just... You know, it's it, of all the arts that it's hard to present on film, I think writing is number one. I mean, yeah. music is tough and painting and whatnot. You want to yeah. see the worst one of those ever? Magic Beyond Words, the J.K. Rowling story. Uh, that's it, a movie. That's a movie, and it is amazing. And if you and if you take a drink, every oh, it's time, a lifetime movie. It's a lifetime right? movie. If you take a drink every time they foreshadow Harry Potter, you will get so hammered. Oh. In 30 minutes. <laughs> but there's this scene where she's typing, she's writing Harry Potter, and oh my god, she's finally doing it. And vines are growing out of the typewriter, oh. and like elves oh. and shit are dancing in her in her room, and it's just like, oh my god, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's like it's like every worst writer movie right. you've it, ever it, seen it, in it, one. It's band. either the people typing or the guy running into the bar with the manuscript. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so none of that bullshit in this movie. The writing has already happened. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, as a journalist, as somebody who like goes and interviews people all the time, and actually had to interview Jason Siegel for this, which was sort of like trippy. Like, <laughs> yeah. Here you are, playing a person who hates being interviewed, being interviewed by me, and how is this going to go? Um, the, what they got right about the way Jesse Eisenberg plays a journalist is yeah. so dead on. Like, There's a moment where... Dave, uh, Jason Siegel leaves the room, and Jesse Eisenberg runs around the house taking notes of anything he thinks might be important. It's basically like Garfield calendar, blue toilet seat cover. Yeah. And right, like just right. who knows what, what might matter later. And just yeah. that, that whole dynamic of where you, where as a journalist you're kind of trying to get him to say something, but you don't want to ask the super obnoxious questions going to shut yeah. it down. It's this very uh, delicate kind of juggling act that you're doing. And I, I imagine if you're being interviewed, which I have only done maybe once or twice, it's that same thing of like, am I saying too much? Is this going to sound like, does, does this sound good coming out of my mouth? Or is it going to be awful on paper? That kind yeah. of thing. So it, it captures the dynamic of the of an actual interview better than, certainly better than Frost Nixon, but better than almost any movie I think I've ever seen. And it's tricky because a part of me doesn't want to judge this movie and talk too much about that element because it's such a personal experience. Not everyone gets to interview famous people. But if you ever do, th this is really much it. Now, you, we usually don't get three days. No. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody's gotten three days since the 90s when this is yeah. set. I, I'm yeah. very, very lucky to get an hour with people like every every couple of weeks. But like seriously, it's it's that dynamic. You want to connect. You want to be personable. You might even want to be friends with the person. You might even really like them a lot. But you never will because this is job. This is business, yeah. and yeah. they don't know what your agenda is. And it's tricky. It's really, really tricky. And this ekes wonderful drama out of it. And this is one of my favorite films of the year. That's I love true. this movie. All right, so I will what? say, when yeah. I had to interview Jason Siegel for this, he yeah. ended up eating half of my lunch. I buy that. Yeah, I but believe that. But you got to write about it, so that's the trade-off. <laughs> I got to write about it, yeah. That's, it's, it's a colorful right. background. So, all right, Bibbs, one of your favorite movies of the year. What's your number? Uh, 9.5. Okay. Just damn, 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 damn good movie. All right, fair enough. Put Ma that on the poster. Miss Amy? I like this movie a lot. However, I guess I'm not in as overjoyous of a mood today, so I'm giving it a 7. All right. And I give it an 8. I think it's a solid piece. Uh... I, I it didn't send me into raptures, but I very much admire what it's doing. I like the performances. I like the writing. Um, so yeah, people should totally check it out. End of the tour, opening this weekend. Uh, thanks.